The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening and welcome to the April 2014 Polyphonic on Campus webinar. I'm Steve Danu from polyphonic.org and we're really pleased to have you with us with others from all over the country and actually tonight all over the world um, for our third in a series of three webinars this spring. Um, tonight we're very excited to have a dynamic duo, I think I would call it, of speakers, Steve Hoffey and Michael Meir from HubSpot. Uh, and they're going to talk with us about public speaking for musicians. Um, and I think given the time that I've had with them preparing for this webinar, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. So um, just a couple of logistics before we begin tonight's presentation. Uh, you'll notice that your phone or computer audio is muted uh, by default just to cut down on background noise or any interruptions. Um, but we absolutely encourage you to ask questions. Uh, and so you can do that by entering a question in the webinar control panel that you have there, and you'll see a question box. You can go ahead and type a question if there at any point in the presentation, uh, but we'll hold them till the end. Uh, and then we'll just read through them and, and try to get to all your questions and, and talk about them, discuss them. Um, so again, we absolutely encourage you to type them in if something comes up at any point go ahead and type it in or at the end think of a question uh, and again we'll hopefully get to all of them. Uh, so without any further ado I want to go ahead and turn it over to uh, Mike and Steve. Thank you very much Thanks, Steve. Steve. It's an absolute pleasure to be joining you all tonight um, and thank you for Polyphonic for inviting us. So tonight's topic is going to be about public speaking for musicians and as you are all musicians you've probably found that sometimes you have you find yourself having to speak uh, in front of an audience when you're probably much more comfortable in front of only your instrument. Um, it is at times a necessary evil, uh, whether it's addressing an audience or addressing a room of students talking about some music education. Um, so Steve Hossie and I have put together a few tips that we have found helpful in our career that will hopefully help you as well. Uh, before we begin, just want to give you a bit of a background on who we are. Um, so here is a little bit about Steve. Thanks, Mike. So it says I did my undergrad at Eastman and then my master's at University of Maryland in trumpet performance. I went on to perform with the U.S. Navy Band in Washington, D.C. Uh, at a certain point, I shifted from music to marketing, online marketing went into business, uh, founded my own company, and eventually joined the fast-growing internet startup HubSpot, where I met Mike, and uh, I've been working for the last couple of years. Uh, as a member of the HubSpot team, I've presented around the country, mostly on the East Coast, but also in Canada, and i um, thrilled to be here. And I am a musician. I studied at the Berklee College of Music. I am a vocalist. I was a music business major there, which led me to work at Blue Note Records, which spun me around and ended up also working in the world of marketing at HubSpot with Steve. Uh, when I'm not a consultant at HubSpot, I'm singing in the Tango Festival Choir here in Boston, which is the chorus in residence for the Boston Symphony Orchestra, and Boston Pops. Um, so I've had the great pleasure of performing with them all over the country, um, including most recently in Carnegie Hall. So just to give you, so we are also musicians, just wanted to let you guys know. Um, we're not just some news here. Um, so here's the agenda today. We wanted to go through some of the points that we thought would be very helpful for you to keep in mind as you move forward with your public speaking careers. Um, so we're going to talk about some of these, all of these points being the central idea of a speech, um, getting emotional buy-in, the focus of tension and release, um, using dynamics, your go-to licks, and practice techniques. The focus of tonight's presentation is to relate the way that you work as a musician to the way that you can work as a public speaker as well. And with that, Steve Hasi, why don't I hand the controls of the webinar over to you. Please. Okay. We good? Can you see the central idea? 
I'm assuming the silence means yes. Yes. Yeah, we're seeing it. Okay. Great. Okay. So just like with a piece of music, you have to start with what's the main point? What's the context for everything that I'm going to be sharing? When you know the fundamental idea, the fundamental emotion, the fundamental experience that you want your audience to have, it makes it easier to think on your toes and not worry as much. You know, you may forget a point here, you may forget a point there, but as long as you know when I'm done, because at some point we will be done, you know, the lights will go off, the show will be over, when I'm done, what do I want people to experience? What am I building this around? That will help enormously. For example, if you're pitching an idea for a new commission or funding for your ensemble, or if you're announcing your next selection from the stage, if you just have that one central piece that you're framing everything around, your, your, your talk will be that much more powerful because you'll be confident in what it is you're trying to explain. Clarity is the master. If people don't understand what you're saying, if they're not clear on it, you're just not going to be effective in your speaking. So being clear, knowing what it is you want to convey, is the most important part of effective public speaking. One layer deeper than that are the points that you're going to hit along the way. Just like movements in a concerto, the overall piece is one thing, but along the way there are going to be different experiences, different ideas that you want to convey, different um, emotions that you want people to feel. These are your anchor points. And so if you forget everything else, what are the main points that you're going to cover? Things that can help this are slides, staying within an outline or an agenda if you're doing a longer talk. As you notice, we have both of those for our talk today. Rather than just winging it, we're saying these are the points we're going to hit. We could forget everything else. If we just follow the slides, it's going to be an effective presentation. The thing with anchor points also are they give the audience something to hold on to. Just like with a musical theme that keeps recurring, if you have something that keeps recurring throughout your talk, it will give people something that they'll recognize it. Right? They have that familiarity experience where when something familiar comes up, we tune back in. We may have tuned out, but something familiar comes and we feel comfortable. We feel that connection with, with the speaker. So give people a reference point with your anchor points. Give yourself something to hold on to with your anchor points. Next, emotional buy-in. We have our friend Frodo Baggins here. What makes The Hobbit such a great story, the Lord of the Rings? Why is it so popular? Why do we have so much, uh, such, a, such a cultural experience around the story? Because we're bought in. We, Frodo himself is a likable character. He's, he's, uh, and he's on a mission, right? So he has a very specific mission. It's a very big mission in the world that's been created. And this is very relevant to you as a speaker, right? You have the context for your piece. That's the world you've created. Maybe it's the art scene in your town. So that's the context. That's the world. That's your Middle Earth. And what's your mission, right? What, what's missing? in your world? What, what are the problems in your world? And what's your mission that you are on? How are you trying to make that world better? Through the funding of this ensemble or this initiative? Through the creation of this piece? Maybe the world is the musical landscape for your particular ensemble type. Right? If you can create a context that people can relate to and then show how your activity is a mission to improve that context, to overcome obstacles. That will serve two purposes. The first is it will give you a guiding light. It will give you your own emotional buy-in. Right? You see, in, in, in The Lord of the Rings, for, he just has to, he has to accomplish it. Right? He has to achieve his mission. And what that does for us, th these insurmountable odds, we resonate with him. We identify 
the character because he's nobody special you know so if you can if you can make jokes if you can point out your foibles if you can roll with the punches while you're on stage if something something goes wrong you kind of laugh at it make a joke about it that will get more emotional buy and more connection between yourself and the audience so bring in your personal story bring in your personal purpose for being there we tend not to care about big ideas as much as we care about people with big ideas so how can you connect with your audience in order to share your big ideas. Similarly, just going to the, uh, the example of the um, announcing a piece from this stage. Right? We love stories of adversity, stories of, of overcoming obstacles. Was the, was the composer of the piece faced with any personal challenges to create that work? What was the context of the world in which they were creating that work? All of these things, they add the human dimension, they add the human touch, and that is what connects the speaker with the audience. <laughs> if you don't have that human touch, if you're just talking about ideas or asking for something or um, speaking with no context, this is what you'll get. Nobody wants to be told what to do, nobody wants to be told how it is. That's why we're going to be offering examples throughout this presentation. That's why we're uh, you know, doing our best to, to, to keep it light and be very, very personable with you because it's very easy for your audience to just stick their fingers in, your, in their ears, not in your ears, in their ears. <laughs> and finally, when you're creating your talk, you have your idea, right? You have the thing that you want to convey. But what is your audience there for? Why are they there? What experience do they want to have? What moves them? Right? So say you're speaking to somebody on the city council. They don't care about your personal artistic fulfillment. That's not their business. They care about the state of their town. They care about what the art scene is like. They care about the happiness of their people. If you can speak to your audience, if you can empty your own desires out and enter the eyes of your audience, that is how you will move them. That's how you can take them on your journey, is by understanding what pulls at their heartstrings. What are the common touch points that you can have with them? Next topic is tension and release. This is something that as musicians, we know a lot about. And the same thing goes with public speaking. <laughs> Arnold, I'm a child of the 80s. I have to have a total recall uh, picture in there. Sorry if you haven't seen the film. It's, it's fantastic. Although if you watch it now, it's actually quite horrible. The, um, the, the, the graphics and everything were, were amazing for the 90s, but they're really bad now. But uh, it was pretty much one of my favorite movies when I was growing up. Um, similar to the, the hero's journey that I was speaking about before, right? What makes the hero's journey so amazing is it might not work out, right? Every step along the way, the hero faces adversity. There's something, there's something in the way that, that Arnold is about to be blown into the atmosphere of Mars behind him there. He's probably going to die when he enters the atmosphere. You know, tension is very high. What can you do in your speech that's going to create a similar effect in your audience? How can you put them on the edge of their seat? What are the challenges and troubles being faced? You know, conflict draws people in. It's, it's where the juice of the story occurs, just like the climax of a piece. It's filled with counterpoint, lack of resolution. That's what makes the resolution so satisfying. You, you think about Tristan and Isolde, where you have five hours of this cord that just won't let you go and then finally it resolves at the end. That was one of my favorite music theory classes was learning about the Tristan chord and how at the end of all of it Wagner kind of works it through to a resolution, you know, doing his doing his best as the creator, as the as the presenter in this case, to to keep the audience in a state of constant suspense. 
throughout his entire work. So in your story or speech, where is the tension? Right? Were you afraid of something that might not work? And you reveal how it did, how it can work. Right? You show the tension of the problem that exists right now. You, you draw the audience in. You pull on what they care about. You build that story. Here's the tension. Here's the problem. What's the vision of the future? Right? That's the tension and the release. If it's all tension, we'll tune out. And if it's all release, what's the point? The other side of tension and release is the strategic use of silence. I'm a trumpet player. I have my Miles Davis picture in there. And we all know as musicians that the notes you don't play are as important as the ones you do. The same thing is true in public speaking. You can use silence for dramatic effect. You can use it to emphasize a point, to allow people to consider what you just said, or as transition between sections of your talk. In fact, silence as a method while you're on stage is actually a very powerful thing, even just in the sense of conveying confidence. Right? Similar to that moment when you're in the recital hall, and you just take a moment before you start to let in the space, focus on the piece, take your breath and then begin. You can take moments like that up on the stage. And it will bring people in. You can, you can share a moment of, even just for a moment, of silence. It projects confidence. It lets people know it's OK to just be here with, with this speaker. They know what they're doing. And so with that, I would like to pass the controls back to Mike to continue on. All righty. Great. Thank you, Steve. Awesome stuff. I'm sorry, everybody. I don't have any sweet pictures from movies, but I think it'll still be exciting, and hopefully you'll still enjoy my section of the presentation. Uh, in fact, I think you may enjoy it more. Um, because oh, really? Yeah, really. Because we're going to talk about using dynamics here. And one of my favorite um, openings of a piece is the Brahms Requiem. And I will always put on the Brahms Requiem and forget the beginning is super quiet. So I'll lean in and I'll hear just faintly that the piece has started, and I'll turn up my stereo. And it grows and it grows and it grows, and, and all of a sudden it's gigantic. And you can use these same dynamics that you use in your music with your public speaking. Just as Steve was saying, to make a point with silence, you can also make a point using those same uh, volume controls that you would with your playing. So. I think a lot of times people have a hard time being more quiet in a speech, but it really can create a strong sense of intimacy, a strong sense of, of importance, and add weight to what you're saying. Conversely, sometimes you just got to get loud. It also helps to emphasize that point when you blast out that fortissimo right in the face of the audience. It can be extremely important and very effective. Now, if you stay that way the whole time, it can get annoying, and you'll be like that little kid with his sensors. So the best way to use dynamics is to vary it throughout the piece. Vocal variety is very important when giving a, uh, a speaking presentation. Also, go-to licks. Now, I don't know if there are any blues players in the audience, but I, I think that of all the players, blues musicians use go-to licks all the time. We're not always fortunate enough to be able to prepare a speech and give a formal presentation. Oftentimes, you'll be asked to speak on a panel, and you won't know what it is you'll necessarily be speaking about other than a general topic. Um, 
blues and, and jazz and improv is very similar. You know what tunes you're going to be playing, but you're not sure exactly what notes you're going to play when throughout the evening. So you have, you develop these go-to licks, or maybe just the head of the tune that you use to kick off your presentation. You can use the same thing with public speaking. So Steve and I work for, as, as he said, a company called HubSpot, and we do a lot of presenting on social media. So I know that when I go speak on social media, or I sit on a panel about it, I have this one go-to lick that I use every time. And it's that my grandmother, beautiful woman, Ruth, she always told me that the good Lord gave us two ears and one mouth. And that's so that we could listen more than we speak. And the same is true in social media. Blah, 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 blah. And then I talk about how important it is to listen on Twitter and Facebook more than it is to just promote your own, your own work. Um, but that story about my grandmother Ruth is a great way for me to kick off that conversation. And it's an easy place that I know that I can go to. And it will give me a chance to think about what I want to say the rest of the time as I'm speaking. Next is practice techniques. Obviously, we all know how important practicing is. And there are a couple different ways to practice your public speaking. First is at home, by yourself. You have to get your, your wood shedding in, practicing in front of the mirror. Um, this is the least glamorous part of public speaking, but it's extremely important. Getting used to going through your speech, getting used to the timing that it will take to deliver your speech, knowing when to use that vocal variety throughout, mapping out what parts are important, where to emphasize, and where to stop. It's also important to practice in front of others. Um, so whether you're at home, inviting your family, speaking in front of your bandmates or other colleagues before you deliver your grand performance, just to get a sense of if there's laughter, how long it takes for the laughter to die down. If there is confusion with your speech, getting that initial feedback is important. In addition to practicing, as you sometimes know, you'll run into those really tricky parts where you often stumble and need to work over and over and over again. That's important in a speech as well. You may stumble on a transition or not be very clear where you want to take your speech. It's important to work that part over and over again so that it becomes second nature to you. But you must also sometimes go top to bottom. Even if you stumble, it's important to go all the way through your presentation without stopping to get a sense of the timing, to get a sense of the flow. You don't want your first time starting your speech and ending your speech straight through to be the, the time when you're on stage delivering that presentation. So with that, we wanted to um, ask uh, Mr. Dan Yu to come back and join us and uh, have you guys ask any questions that you have for us. I know we had some questions before this evening's uh, presentation began. We probably have some additional questions now. So if you haven't had a chance yet, please, we invite you to put some of your questions into the control panel. And um, Steve, I'll let you uh, ask some of the, the questions that we've already received. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Um, we have a question here. Let me just pull it up. Um, it says, I'd love to hear the speakers comment on designing your talk to a specific audience. For example, how would you change talking about a piece of classical music to a group of high school students compared to a group of senior citizens? Mm -hmm. um, Steve, I'll start on this one if you want to jump in after. Does that work? So saw you. Great. Um, this makes me think about that slide that Steve Poppy showed where the audience was looking up on stage and um, talking about the what's, what's in it for the audience. So as the speaker, um, similar to you know, probably the lesson you got when you were writing in college or high school, know your audience. Who is it that you're presenting to? Um, and understanding what it is they want to get out of it. So for a group of seniors, for instance, after a concert, if you're performing at a retirement center, know what it is that they want to get out of that presentation. Most likely it's education. Perhaps it's 
a relationship to the pieces that you were playing from their youth um, versus giving those same pieces presented to a high school course. Uh, you may have two different types of a high school course. You may have a class full of aspiring musicians who are really interested in how you were able to work through and choose these pieces and select this music. Or you might have a group of high school students who are there because it was either this class or an extra gym class and they didn't want to do the extra gym class. It is your responsibility as the speaker to know why they are there and what they can get out of that presentation. So even if it's just entertainment, you might be able to drop some interesting nuggets and educate them as well. But knowing what it is they want from you can help you direct the focus of your speech. Steve, anything to add? I think that's perfect, man. That's, that's exactly what I would say. Um, you, you hit every single point. Every single one? Uh, the one thing that I would, every single point there was to make. Um, what, what I'd like to do with this, though, is, is use um, an example from, from, my, uh, from my, my past with, with creating, creating a successful presentation with, with a specific outcome that, that I wanted from the presentation, but the only way to actually get the outcome that you want is to know the outcome that your audience wants. Right, so let's say you want to get a standing gig at the uh, a place where you perform for the, uh, uh, for the seniors. Let's say you want to um, get a recurring gig at, at, the, at, at, the, at that venue. Your desire is to get the gig. Their desire is to learn, be entertained, um, walk away with something important. You have to meet their objective in order to meet your objective. And so, so understanding your audience's objective is, is the most important thing. Um, and so then do some research. What is it that they want? What has been helpful? What has been successful in the past? You know, the person who has um, gotten the best results from that particular audience, what did they do? You know, do your research, stay up on it. Um, I'll just tell tell my story. It's one of my one of my favorites. While while you type in any questions you may have, uh, so so back in what was it 2000 or so, I was, I was in a brass quintet at, at Eastman, and we were given an extra year to uh, to stay at school. Uh, four of us had graduated, and our trombonist was graduating the next year. So during that year, we did a uh, a residency in Corning, New York. And during that time, we played at uh, the Corning Glassworks, Corning, Corning Incorporated, and we met went to people there, and we learned that the next year was their 150th anniversary. Their sesquicentennial is the official word for 150th anniversary. Didn't know that. And uh, so one day, I was just sitting in my in my bedroom practicing, and and it hit me. The name of my brass quintet was the Prism like glass, not like a prison, prison brass quintet, and uh, that was a common misconception. Oh, the prison brass, that's interesting. Like, no, not the prison brass, <laughs> the prison brass. So, so we were the prison brass, and I thought, well, wait a second. The prison brass, Corning Glass, and my favorite composer at the time, who's still on my list of top five, is Philip Glass. And they're having their 150th anniversary, and so I had this, the thought was born, I was like, what if? What if Corning Incorporated were to commission a piece for my brass quintet written by Philip Glass? It's entirely possible. So I started talking with my, my, um, my connection, the other person I was working with, and I basically built out this whole presentation, hitting on as many points as possible why this would be amazing for Corning to do. I wasn't talking about why we'd love to do it. I was talking about why we would be the ensemble for them to pick. You know why our track record is such that you know we'd be the the, the, the group to roll this out and not anybody else. And so I just put together all the main points that would seal this deal. And lo and behold, I presented it. They talked it over, worked some things through, and we managed to secure budget and secure the okay to actually get a commission from Philip Glass. He and his team said, "Okay, we'll do it." A um, couple months down the road, they said. 
uh, isn't going to work by their timeline, so they pulled out. But we still got a commission from, from a different composer, Jeff Beal, who's also a, an Eastman grad. It's a great piece, got a recording out of it as well. And um, the whole thing came just from a crazy idea that we then researched and then presented with the, uh, the best interests of the audience in mind. Great. Um, another question we have here says, how do your principle apply to a one to two minute speech to introduce a piece? Hmm. Great question. Um, I think that certainly having your, your go-to licks would be in there, knowing what will work for that audience, knowing um, how to present that piece. If it's a certain artist that you are presenting every time, um, being able to speak to that artist um, briefly and know exactly what's going to resonate with that audience. Um, and kind of, again, what, what Steve was talking about, knowing what's in it for them, what's the central idea. Um, you're presenting that piece, but you're also thinking that piece. Mm -hmm. What you say to present um, will be most likely the, you're setting the table, you're giving the audience the initial ideas and the initial emotion that they will feel as the piece begins. So it is up to you to understand that central idea of the piece and prepare their ears for it, I believe. Kasi? Yeah. Yes, sir, Lemire. Nobody wants information in a vacuum. If I were to say one thing about the one-minute blurb, it's no one wants information in a vacuum. So what does that mean? Nobody cares about, like, J.S. Bach lived from 1685 to 1750, and he wrote the, you know, Toccata and Fugue in D minor while he was the organist at St. Mark's Cathedral in Venice. No, sorry. But, uh, you know, that's like, it's irrelevant to my life. What do people want to know? It's like what Mike said. Here's the emotion that this brings up for me. Here's, here's uh, the, the setting of that piece. Um, I would say also it's something that we've been trying to do during the uh, discussion here to varying levels of, of success, but using humor. You know, it has to be authentic to your ensemble, but one of the most successful musical acts of the, of the small group setting is in the Canadian Mass. One of their um, uh, principal tools of, of that success has been, obviously, their great musicianship, but also their, uh, their use of humor. You know, people want to connect with somebody on stage. When you can make a joke, when you can bring up something that's personal or funny, then that's, that's a moment to connect with the audience. That takes the information out of the vacuum into a relationship. Awesome. A uh, related question that came in said, how important do you think it is to have a quote-unquote elevator speech by your career, what you do, or business ideas. Yeah, I'll I'll jump ahead. <laughs> I want to. I, to me, the elevator pitch is a fancy uh, way of what I was talking about the licks earlier. I think it is extremely important. You never know who is going to be around when you're going to get a chance to speak to that one person who could change your career. Um, for instance, if I was sharing this before you guys, before we opened up the uh, webinar this evening, at Berkeley, I was one of the first mascots they had there. It was a giant cat costume. I was Mingus the Jazz Cat. It was a big cat costume, had sunglasses and a beret. I never thought that I would be meeting anyone while I was in that suit. I was backstage for a concert in, in the suit had to take it off, having some water, and who's next to me at the buffet table is Aretha Franklin. Uh, of course, she was at the buffet table. I'm sorry, I'm joking, Aretha. She's a big boned gal. Um, and I, I didn't need anything for, from her at the time. I didn't have an elevator pitch, but you never know when you're going to be at the buffet table with Aretha Franklin. And when you are there, you probably want to uh, grab a banana and make sure that you're, you're able to say precisely 
what you wish you could say if you had that opportunity. So whether it's a record executive, someone who can give you funding, um, a conductor, whoever it is that, that you hope to speak to, you don't want to be searching for words then, you want to have it immediately. Absolutely. Nothing to add, man. That was it. And you managed to get the banana in the frame. That was just, you. that was you. our one that was our one goal. We had two goals. The first was to teach people about how to speak. The second was to have the banana in the presentation. It was our humor that Steve spoke about earlier. <laughs> awesome. Another question here says, have you um, can you speak? to using visual aids to enhance your public speaking. I noticed that you use mostly images and pictures in your presentation tonight. Oh, that's good. What do you think about text on slides? Text on slides. So there's a certain thing called death by PowerPoint. And the instrument of uh, disembowelment is text. And so what, what happens is people use their slides as a crutch for what they want to say. And then they just read their slides. And that's literally the worst thing you could do. It would be better to not be there than to just read your slides. If you have text that you want to convey, that's cool. You should do it. But it should be just a chunk, just a small thing. Usually, um, you know, agenda items. It has to serve the end listener. Have it have it serve your audience, not you. Most of the time that. Writing on the slide is just for the speaker so that you don't forget what you're going to say. Have it serve the end user and have them have the experience of your talk. If you have um, a handout or you want to give a, uh, an outline or even a written version of your talk afterwards for educational purposes, that's fine. Create that separately. Don't use your slides as a proxy for what you're going to say. Yeah, exactly. And what's great about that is as a vocalist, you know, we're able to use words to enhance the music. Um, I, I think when you're using visual aids for a presentation, words sometimes detract. Um, but your images can enhance the emotion. So if I uh, were to jump back into the slides, for instance, um, you know, I, I chose this slide to enhance your understanding and, and give you that moment we've all you know perhaps you should all go see a gospel choir you know this guy looks like he is really taking it to church and some gospel choir and if we've been there you know that dynamic range so I can speak to it I can even give you an example of it but what this image here does is it enhances the viewers experience much more so than if I said um, you can speak loudly sometimes in text on the slide. Yeah, I guess just as a as a corollary to that, um, you know, because what is life if not paradox? I would say, for for instance, like the hero's journey one. I have this picture of Frodo. So you have Frodo, and he's likable, and he's got that little thing about the the, the ring on his face, and you the whole story is conjured just in in that image of him. At the same time, maybe it would be helpful to have some of those points that I spoke to. So you know, maybe another slide after that that would say um, likable character and um, facing challenging times and uh, overcome adversity. You know, so, so there is text if you want to do a recap of a particularly big situation you say, this is what we covered. Um, one of the most helpful pedagogical tools that I have heard is um, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. And so you can, you can use text, bullet points, just high-level things as part of that flow to kind of reinforce either what you just told somebody or what you're going to tell them. Cool. This is sort of a related question which says, how, in addition to slides, do you keep the roadmap of your presentation clear in your mind while you are speaking? The in addition to would be Mike's last slide there. Practice, 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 practice. Like the more you've actually just done the roadmap, the easier the roadmap's going to be to keep clear. 
Yeah, I, I know as a, in, in the chorus that I sing in, we are, I think, one of the few choruses that memorize everything. So, um, Mozart, Rubrian, uh, Brahms, Misa Solemnis, everything we sing. Stravinsky. Is, Stravinsky, Symphony of Psalms, last week, we memorized. Um, we don't use a score on stage. And once you practice it enough, you probably know this as a musician, you, it, it just starts to come out of you. You're not thinking about what's next. You just are playing a phrase, and then it's just like you're forced to deliver the next phrase. It's beyond your control at a certain point. Um, so practicing a presentation, especially if it's a long one, um, can help with that. Um, to Steve's point uh, earlier, also though those anchor points. So um, if you're knowing that yeah. you, if you know that you have four major anchor points, and um, the phrases that you want to use to deliver those anchor points are blah 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 blah. Um, you just have to remember what order those four points come in, and then just work to transition between them throughout your presentation. Great. Another question here says, do you guys ever get nervous in public speaking? And how do you Never. deal with Are you nervous? kidding me? Come on. <laughs> Who gets nervous? Uh, <laughs> sure. Yeah. All the time. Uh, I had to give a presentation at, uh, at a company last year, and I remember that I spent all night. I, I didn't sleep the whole night before because I was so nervous for the presentation. And uh, most of the night I spent thinking about, well, you know, probably it was supposed to be an all-day presentation, so literally an eight-hour presentation. And I remember thinking, well, they'll probably be polite and let me speak for an hour, and then we'll take a break, and then they'll, they'll just ask me to go home. Um, it, it, they didn't. It, it went well. It was a great presentation. But... Um, to build up my confidence earlier, uh, forgive me, some of you may not like this musician, but I listened to a bunch of Kanye West in the morning. I was pretty tired. Kanye West has a lot of confidence in himself, so when I listened to him, it helped kind of put the confidence back in me, and I thought that I could do it. Um, so just having that confidence in yourself, and even if you have to pretend that you have that confidence in yourself, once you get going, um, you'll usually, once you get that first reaction from the crowd, then uh, that fear usually goes away for me. Yeah, same here. Um, there is yet to be a time when I've gotten on stage that I'm not nervous. And the challenge for me and, and, and what I, my practice is reminding myself that it's not a problem to be nervous. And as Mike said, within the first two minutes, three minutes, five minutes, ten minutes, whatever it is, at some point I will just be in the flow, in the groove, nothing to worry about. And honestly, it's just the confidence of having done that enough times to know there's nothing to worry about. If I come on stage and I have something to say, I will be nervous. My hands will shake. Like I shouldn't hold up a piece of paper in the first three minutes because everyone will be like, whoa, dude, that thing's really going nuts up there. You know, so just do the things that will keep you calm and in control. But uh, other than that, you just you just roll with it, and it'll it'll be cool. Great. Another question here said, in a concert setting, how long do you think is too long for speaking about the music? Hmm. Well, I guess it it, it depends again on on what the who the audience is. So if it is a relatively educated audience who is there to hear the music and they know what was going on in Beethoven's life at that point, they know just how deaf he was and they know that it was at the end of his life and they know which period it was, um, you probably don't need to explain all that. Uh, versus a, a younger audience who may not know who Stravinsky is, or, or why this music sounds as radical as it sounds, um, setting the stage, as long as it takes to set the emotional stage for the piece you are about to or have just played, um, I would say is what you should do. There's no, I don't think there's a set, I can't say, 
two minutes and 35 seconds. It's, it'll vary from uh, presentation to presentation. Agreed. Great. Another question is how much of public speaking is improvised in the moment, responding to the audience, you know, whether or not they laugh at your jokes, the mood of the room, that sort of thing? Again, it depends on the context. Um, you know, when, when you go to a Canadian brass show, their patter is as written as the notes. I mean, it's like they have it dialed in exactly the jokes they're going to tell because those are the jokes that have gotten the biggest laugh. And if they say, "Okay, let's let's change up the jokes," let's change. It's it's very they're professionals, you know, so it's very calculated. Um, they have just two minutes to give you that experience, to give you that big laugh, maybe only thirty seconds. And so, so that's calculated. That's not um, uh, improvised. At the same time, um, you know, if you're speaking and, and like if someone's asking you a question, that's entirely improvised. And you want to be able to have the same degree of uh, composure and insight and, and persuasive power when you're speaking extemporaneously as you do when you're speaking with something prepared. And so one of the things that we haven't mentioned yet, but it's actually pretty important, is avoiding crutch words as much as possible. You may have noticed when, when Mike and I are speaking that we, we tend not to say, uh, or, and like, you know, like those things that you would say in more casual conversation or if you're just kind of thinking off the top of your head. When you're on stage, you have to own the stage. and so. Even if you are improvising, you want people to think that guy, I had no idea. That, that lady, she's just with it. You know? So in the end, it ends up probably being half and half. But the more you cultivate your skills, the more powerful you can become as a public speaker, the less people will know he's making that up. Or, wow, that's, the more they'll just feel the authenticity. That's the thing. The, the main point is the authenticity. I, I always do try to read the room, which makes, um, to be honest, speaking engagements like this somewhat difficult because um, you get, I have no idea if you guys think that I am funny or, or not, but um, what I'll usually try to do is begin a presentation with a question that where I can get a, a feel for the room. So. Whether they respond vocally or they they respond with applause or with hands, I get a, an understanding of who they are and where they're at that day. Awesome, really interesting question just came in, which says, "What is your best approach to someone who is trying to derail your speech?" Oh, that's good. <laughs> wow, I'm. I'm I'd like to hear what situations that speaker has been in before. Steve Hasi, what do you have on that? You get heckled quite a bit, don't you? Well, so here, oh yeah, well the thing is I get heckled all the time. And also, uh, I'm just kidding, I don't really get heckled. Um, <laughs> as a consultant though, this, this is something that I learned in my role at HubSpot. Um, I get on the phone with our customers and I help them with their, with their marketing strategy, help them implement our software, all, all of these things. And there's Sometimes there will be someone with a very specific point who has a total ax to grind or you know, they're, they're just trying to get you on this one particular thing. And, and, you, and you can't say, that's invalid. You know, You're invalid. Shut your mouth. Like you, you, are, that's, you cannot do that. And so what you need to do is you have to validate the point. Or you, know, you have to say, OK, I hear you. I, I understand what you're saying. If it's utterly off track, like if by, by getting into it with that person would actually derail the larger point, the, the larger thing that's happening, then you can say, I would be happy to discuss this with you afterwards, or you know, um, I'll get to that later in my presentation. Uh, could you please hold questions till the end? In the end, you are the person on stage, and it's your responsibility as the presenter to make sure that the whole experience is as positive as possible for everybody. So if one person insists on um, taking it their direction, 
you just take control back and you say, thank you for your thought, let's cover that at the end, or let's speak afterwards, or I'll get to that later. Right now I have this to cover. They'll feel heard, they'll feel understood, and, you, and the rest of the audience will feel grateful that you're in charge, that you're still guiding them, rather than being derailed by this person with another agenda. Nothing to add, yeah, spot on. Yeah, yeah. We we'll probably have a couple of more questions. Um, another one here says, what are some strategies for coming up with answers to questions that you don't immediately have an answer for? Just say, uh, until something comes to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what I usually use my, my lick um, method for. So um, if someone asks about, like I said, for social media, I'll, I'll tell that grandma story, I'll, I'll say. You know, one thing that's really interesting about social media, and, and just have that go-to quote, um, which you can deliver without necessarily having to think about it while letting your mind um, go to the, the true answer that you want to give. Uh, you know, there's, I really don't think there is a problem with uh, acknowledging that it's a difficult question. Also, in saying that is a really good question, and thinking about it, and using Steve's method of, of silence, silence is okay on stage. It, it hurts. It can hurt for a new speaker. Silence can be very painful, but it's, it's good to live within that pain and it become less and less painful, because it's never as long as you think it is as the speaker. So allowing that silence to occur and showing the audience that you are giving a, a thoughtful answer is OK. Good. Great. Well, one last question for our speakers before we wrap things up. I think this is, a, is appropriate for our webinar tonight. What is your most embarrassing public speaking moment, <laughs> and, what did you, and what did you learn from it? Uh, I have mine. Assy, do you have yours? I can go. Oh, I do. I do. I have a good one. You go with yours, and then I'll go with mine. Okay. I mean, it's not. It's not that embarrassing. I lost my cash traffic one, but it was pretty good. So I, I, I'm I'm a part of the Toastmasters group at at my um at my company, and if you get a chance to participate in Toastmasters, do it. It's a lot of fun. You will learn a ton about public speaking and make some really good friends. So uh, I, was, I was participating in a, in a contest, actually. It was an evaluation competition where somebody gives a speech, and then the evaluators come into the room one after the other after the other, and they give their evaluation on the speech. So I get up there at the front of the room, and it's my turn. You know, I'm, I'm in front of this group of like maybe 40 Toastmasters, most of whom I don't know. And, and I had to evaluate this lady who gave this speech. Now, I'm pointing and gesturing and responding tremendously to this woman back in the left-hand corner of the room until about halfway through I realize that's not the lady who gave the speech. <laughs> the lady who actually gave the talk is over there. And the woman, that's why that, was, that's why that woman was giving me such a funny look. <laughs> and so what I learned from it is, first of all, don't let that throw you. Just Keep on being your bad self. And second, if you don't know exactly who you're supposed to be referring to, either say, where are you, where are you, and get the person, <laughs> or just speak to the audience in general. Speak in the third person. Did you notice how wonderful her presentation was? And when she said such and such, don't even try to find her. So those were the two things I learned from my most embarrassing moment today. Mine, mine was uh, a public speaking um, session that was not intended to be a speaking engagement. Uh, it was actually supposed to be a recital. It was my very first recital. Um, I was a freshman in high school and I came in and I was uh, accepted into the honors choir uh, right up, right as a freshman. And um, it rarely happened and so people came to, to see the, hear the freshman recital and my teacher was there and um, there were a lot of people there and it, we got our final grade based on this, and it was all supposed to be memorized. And 
I didn't prepare anything. Um, I had pieces ready to go. I had an accompanist, and I uh, used my music, and I still didn't know it. Um, you know, for any of those singers out there, it was from the uh, Italian Arias book. It was from the, the 24 hits uh, from Italy. Um, and I looked at my music, mumbled through it, and after I fumbled through three songs, I looked at the audience and I said, thank you all very much for coming. I apologize. I did not prepare my music very well. And then I sat down. <laughs> so that, uh, that was very embarrassing and very hard. And that taught me the importance of practicing um, and the importance of taking a look at your music before you have to deliver a recital. And we we covered that in in preparing for this uh, for this talk. And I told Mike, I said, if ever there was a hero's journey story between the two of us, that would certainly be one. Okay. Going from not even knowing your music to being able to memorize a Stravinsky uh, chorale or a Brahms mass. I mean, that's 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 learning from one's failures. It sure is. That sure is. Yeah. So practice, 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 everyone. That's the answer. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I want to go ahead and thank Mike Lemire and Steve Hossi from HubSpot for taking the time to be with us tonight. Just a wonderful presentation and discussion and uh, a lot of fun. So we thank you guys for all you've done, sharing your thoughts and expertise with us. And I want to thank everyone for tuning in tonight. And uh, We'll have three new webinars coming up this fall. Uh, we look forward to sharing those with you. Uh, in the meantime, keep your eye on polyphonic.org for uh, webinar announcements and other content. Uh, thanks to everyone for being here. And uh, again, this webinar will be recorded and available on polyphonic.org within a few days. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks again. Thanks, Steve. Good night, thanks, everyone. Steve. Bye-bye. Okay.